Hi everyone, I'm Celeste. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I hope everybody's been having a great week and um, a great month of April. Um, just recently heard about a great um, April tag that I was interested in doing and it centers on nonfiction. I was kind of looking forward to this uh, April tag and I'll tell you about it now. Um, it's called The People April Biography and Memoir Readathon, and that's right up my alley because if you know me, you know that I love social history and uh, women's history, especially, and all of that. So, this was a tag that was started by Elizabeth of Bokens and Books, and also. Um, Roz at Scally Dandling about the books. So for People April, you are invited to read nonfiction through the prism of people. Biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, diaries, letters, and other ephemera, etc. And all you need to participate is to read one book in any format. And um, the hosts of this readathon do give a series of prompts to inspire you. I'll list those down below as well as provide links to both Elizabeth and Roz's channels. So um, I kind of went in my own direction with this tag and I'm still choosing some more books for a future TBR pile because I'm really enjoying reading biographies. Um, but I've chosen three to share with you today. So without any further ado, let's get into it. The first is Marie Antoinette and this is by Antonia Fraser. If you know me, you know that I love Antonia Fraser, and I've read a number of her works. Last fall, I was talking about um, Mary Queen of Scots, and um, I have several others that I'm looking forward to reading. Um, this particular beautiful hardcover edition, if you want to look at the inside papers here, the end papers, it's beautiful. And sort of a floral fabric look and this is published by Wiedenfeld and Nicholson of London. You can tell from the number of um, spots I've sticky noted that I really got a lot out of this book and it is a chunky monkey. This is over 500 pages. Um, it does have some photographs in a center section. However, I love Antonia Fraser's writing style, and so for me, this went by pretty quickly. I got through this in um, a week and a half, I wanna say, and that was just by reading maybe two to three chapters per day. Um, so, wow. What a revelation this book was. Marie Antoinette, if Fraser is accurate, was basically a bored young woman who was forced to come to this court uh, to marry Louis. She didn't want to. Um, if you picture like somebody's pretty young niece um, who's sort of college age um, in today's terms and uh, just wants to party and have fun and gets bored easily and she's really good at music and she's a sort of type A personality and she just loves parties and making friends and fashion and all of that. That to me seems like Marie Antoinette. Was it worth being guillotined for? I don't think so. Uh, but it, she was basically scapegoated and used as a symbol for the uh, revolution. There are so many incredible moments in Fraser's book telling the story of Marie Antoinette, um, her arrival at court, um, Mozart, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart coming to the court when he was a little boy, and then later when he grew up coming back and um, music lessons and um, the brutal cold winter of 1776, where here in the United States, it was also a time of revolution. But over in France, um, Antonia Fraser talks about Marie Antoinette taking 
sledge rides um, from Versailles with her friend, uh, Madame de Lamballe, and um, the white horses with feathered headdresses and the sledge bells that are gilded in gold and um, dressing in ermine and fur and um, you know taking rides for something to do through the countryside um, and then there were uh, white monkeys and birds there was a whole menagerie of animals at Versailles apparently and there were white monkeys that would swing from the drapes through the hallways and um, sometimes get into the ladies makeup and the monkeys would powder their faces mimicking the humans and then sort of swing from drapes through Versailles and it was kind of like an indoor zoo. Um, then she talks about Le Petit Trianon and how Marie Antoinette loved to entertain there and have young friends come there and they would do like a typical young person sort of thing where they would stay up until dawn and then go out and watch the sunrise. You know, she's not entirely blameless but at least this puts her in context and um, I think Antonia Fraser, as usual, did a fantastic job, a brilliant job, uses tons of primary sources, and um, yeah, I love this. I would give this book five stars. Now, one thing I would recommend before trying this book, um, there is a documentary of Marie Antoinette available on PBS, and it's about an hour, hour and a half long, really really good and it really sort of simplifies and breaks down um, Marie, Louis the 16th, the French Revolution, um, the Reign of Terror, what was happening at the time and so that's really good and I found that watching that first made reading this much easier Easy. I love this book. I found it fascinating. I want all of Antonia Frazier's books and I just think you need a little bit of an introduction to um, the history of that time period and if you watch that PBS documentary and then try this book I think you'll really really enjoy it. I give this one five stars. The next book I'd like to review for you is Marie Antoinette's Confidant, The Rise and Fall of the Princess de Lamballe by Jerry Walton. This is a book from Pen and Sword and um, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's a shorter read, so um, much more manageable um, in terms of length. Um, this book is described as a biography of Marie-Thérèse de Lamballe and Marie-Thérèse de Lamballe, um, her childhood was in Italy. She had a disastrous uh, marriage which only lasted a year and her husband uh, was quite the partier and he um, passed of syphilis um, one year into the marriage. She was introduced at court to Marie Antoinette at Versailles and she rose to become Marie Antoinette's superintendent of the household. Um, so a very high position and it follows Lamballe up through the days of the French Revolution and to her untimely abbreviated death at the hands of a mob during the terror uh, in 1792 and she was only 42 years old when she was brutally killed by this mob and um, I thought that this book was good. I think I was spoiled by the fact that I had just come off reading Antonia Frazier um, so I'm not quite sure what I was expecting it I think the issue I had with it is that it's supposed to be about um, Lamballe and it is but it's really sort of more the same story I had just finished reading in the Fraser book um, yes told from the viewpoint of Madame de Lamballe um, but I found the writing style a little bit uneven. The narrative uh, would start getting into something really, really interesting and then suddenly it would very quickly rush over other facts that I thought 
deserved several pages um, of discussion. Um, so things like her actual death at the hands of the mob was dealt with within a page or two, and I didn't think that that really did justice to it. Um, I think she could have um, evoked a lot more emotion from me as a reader if she had gone into it a little bit more. Um, but I did find really interesting a couple of other things. One was um, the story of Madame du Barry, who is the mistress of Louis the Fifteenth. And if you've been watching the Marie Antoinette series on PBS, um, you've seen Madame de Berry and seeing her spar with Marie Antoinette. So her backstory is really actually very interesting. And in um, the Marie Antoinette show on PBS um, that they're showing here on Sunday nights right now, you really don't learn the history of uh, Madame du Barry. And this sort of gives her backstory, how she grew up, why she was the way she was, and it makes you a little bit more empathetic towards her. Um, so that was really fascinating. And then um, it's it also um, gives a great description of the hair fashions of the time and what they were called, these poofs, and um, gives some anecdotes about some of the styles, you know, that you've probably seen with the big ships with the masts and the birds and all of that. And um, so that part was also really interesting in terms of fashion history. So overall, I thought it was good. It wasn't great. Um, I think it's worth reading, certainly. And I would give this one three stars out of five, I think. And finally, um, I think I have saved maybe even the best for last. Um, I don't know, it's kind of a toss-up between this one and the Antonia Frazier Marie Antoinette book. Um, but the third book I wanted to do a review of for you today is Madame Tussaud, Her Life and Legacy. This is also by Jerry Walton, and um, this is also from Pen and Sword. Oh, this book. It is marvelous. <laughs> it is so fascinating. Madame Tussaud, who knew? I mean, we all know that she created wax figures and she started Tussaud's Wax Museum, um, which has many locations, um, perhaps the most famous actually being in London, not Paris. Um, but wow, did she live through so much and experience so much. It's fascinating. And if you look, look at all my little notes that I have here and my little bookmarks in here. So she lived through the French Revolution. She lived through the Reign of Terror. Her story bridges the late 1700s and the French Revolution all the way into the uh, first part of the 1800s and the ascension of Queen Victoria to the throne. So this woman lived right in the fray, in the middle of all of it. She knew everybody. Um, she met and modeled Marie Antoinette, Marat, Robespierre, Voltaire, Benjamin Franklin, Napoleon sat twice for her, once when uh, he rose to power and again when he was exiled before he was sent away. Um, she knew Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria brought her children to Tussauds and um, didn't announce herself, just came in and looked at the exhibits and Marie Tussaud recognized her. Um, the book is full of first person accounts, excerpts from uh, Madame Tussaud's diaries. Um, Madame Tussaud had a bad marriage. Um, she had had some children by a gentleman and left him and uh, he kept trying to take all of her money. It's the story of her touring through Scotland and Ireland and going, you know, on sort of a road show with her creations. Um, and this was at a time when women couldn't really own property and didn't have much agency. Um, and she was trying to establish herself as a famous businesswoman. Um, she 
um, went through several shipwrecks. Um, she also was a person who was kind of a notorious embellisher, and you can kind of get that from the fact that she creates these wonderful tableaus uh, and creates narratives, creates stories. Um, and, you know, it. this book is just marvelous and it's a pretty quick read. I just want to read you one excerpt from this and this is when she was working in um, as a young girl in Dr. Curtius's wax shop and um, learning the trade of making uh, wax figures. Okay so it says the room was a flickering nightmare of sorts somber and dark, lit only by candles. Arms and legs were tossed on shelves, laying in piles or propped in corners. And in the shadows stood several frozen, lifeless figures, and a ghastly pair of headless bodies leaned against one wall. What made Dr. Curtius's building even more ghastly was the pervasive, deathly silence that seemed as if it was like an eerie warning cry to visitors. Perhaps the eeriest cry came from the graveyard of pristine heads weirdly featured in well-ordered rows sitting on a shelf against a gray mortared stone wall as if carved headstones. Some heads were toothless, some hairless, and some eyeless, yet their features were still so lifelike that even in their half-finished states they seemed bizarrely real. This indeed is truly um, the real life Game of Thrones, um, just in terms of witnessing executions. This is a woman who, after famous people were guillotined, their heads were immediately brought to her so that she could model their death masks. And uh, sometimes the head still warm from the body, tossed into her lap, um, which is extremely gruesome, but um, it's what really happened. And um, I found this book absolutely fascinating. You know, a woman in Paris witnessing the Reign of Terror and the Court of Versailles and uh, the Revolution and witnessing the rise of Napoleon and then um, the end of the war and traveling around and establishing herself in London and then the rise of Queen Victoria. It's a fascinating story. This book is worth every penny. Written by the same woman that wrote the Lombard book, but for some reason, Jerry Walton, I think, does a much more cohesive um, storytelling job in this. She tells a much better narrative. Um, so she really got her chops in this book, if um, you want to put it that way. But just a fantastic read and worth every cent. So Madame Tussaud, pick up a copy. That's all that I have for today. Um, I do have a lot of other books that I'm interested in trying to sort of sandwich in. Um, you know, in the following week, I don't know if I'm going to get to them, but I love biographies, I love letters, I love diaries and first person accounts, and um, I think that I'm really in future going to be including more of those in my reading choices and in terms of what I present to you guys. So um, uh, I hope you're as fascinated by all of that as I am. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, what's left of it, and a great upcoming week, and I will see you again really soon. Bye-bye.